Hey there, welcome back to EE386. This is going to be the lecture for class number 16. So we're getting really close to the end of the semester and we're going to pretty much stay in the frequency domain for the rest of this semester. Um, so in this class, we'll talk about Bode plots and, and really this is the approximate way of sketching Bode plots. This is necessary because we're going to be able to get a, a good view of what's happening with a system over a frequency uh, range. So basically everything that happens with the magnitude and phase. We can also take a Bode plot, take points from it, and draw the Nyquist plot from that. So it's really useful for that reason. And uh, the Nyquist plot has a set of specific criteria which allows us to see if a system, given the open loop transfer function, is stable or not. So for the closed loop system, that is. So we'll talk a bit more about Nyquist in the next lecture. But for now, let's concentrate on how to draw a Bode plot and really what they are and why they're useful. So we're going to talk about a few different things. And really, uh, before we go any further, Chapter 8 in your text, if you're using version number 13, it is chapter 8, uh, that really talks about frequency analysis in general, and Bode plots is a section in that, I believe section number 2 out of that. So if you want more examples, you can go there. I'm going to do a few examples in this lecture, um, but uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the standard form and conversion, and our goals with Bode plots. We're also going to talk about the different aspects of a transfer function and how they would affect the Bode plot, how it looks. Okay. I, before we go any further, I do want to make a note that your MATLAB version of the Bode plot will not look identical to the sketching methods. So instead of, you know, just, just in case anyone's thinking of plugging things into MATLAB and just getting the plot out easy peasy. <laughs> you can use that to check. The behavior should be the same, but the approximate Bode plot will look a little different because we're, you know, we're humans. We're doing an approximate sketch. We're not calculating a ton of values over a range, so it's going to look a little different, okay? However, these are very useful, okay? And we can fill up them pretty quickly. So in general, what is a Bode plot? Well, you've probably seen one before. If you're EE by this time in your academic career, you would have encountered a Bode plot at some point. It's really a set of two plots, okay? Uh, they are plotted over the frequency range. We call that frequency range omega, and it's only the positive range. So we only go from omega equals zero to some very large omega, okay? The axis, Although it doesn't have to be in the, the omega axis, that is, it is usually log plots, okay? So it's usually a log scale uh, axis, okay? So that means that we have decades rather than just the individual points, okay? All right, so we would start at omega equals zero, and we would start, say, at a range of omega, omega from zero, to one, that would be one decade. And then from one to 10, so factor by 10, would be a second decade. And then 10 to 100 would be another decade. These are all shown as equal distances on the plot, even though in reality they aren't. It helps us scale down a lot of space, a lot of information down to something where we can spot a trend. Okay, that's really the, the main reason for using log scale. Okay. The, the other axis, now I said it was a, a group of two plots that you might already be familiar with, the magnitude and the phase angle. Okay, So those are going to be your y-axis, axes, rather. Um, and we usually plot them one, one plot and then the other plot right beneath it. So we can share the same scaling for the omega, the frequency. Okay. All right, so in general, uh, there are some detailed rules for plotting Bode plots, and if you take a, an advanced filter design kind of course, you're going to encounter much more in-depth kind of rules than we'll discuss here. Uh, we're just going to do the basic, uh, basic rules, okay? Uh, we're going to discuss constants, how they affect each plot, 
zeros and poles and wherever the zeros and poles are. Being at the origin versus being at some non-origin point means that they affect the plots differently. Okay, Our main goal for using body plots, as I said before, is really to get to where we can assess stability. And we mostly use these in conjunction with the Nyquist plot. Now, there is another type of plot aside from uh, Nyquist called the Nichols plot. That's in your textbook. We don't usually cover that. Um, you can usually use one or the other. And um, there are certain parts of the world where they choose one or the other and it's not necessarily Nyquist all the time. But generally, we, we will go with the Nyquist for this class. All right. One other thing to note, if you take a course in classical control or you study classical control at some point, you can use the features of the Bodhi plot to design your controller, to design your G sub C structure. Okay. You can use things like a phase margin and, and such to design that. Okay. And before we pass on uh, this page, uh, Bodhi plot, it is called Bodhi. Bodhi plot, that's how you pronounce it. Uh, it's named for uh, Hendrik Wade Bodhi, and he's the one that used it originally for frequency analysis. Okay, so, <clears throat> so far we have been working with transfer functions, g of s. Uh, that was our kind of structure. We were been in, in the Laplace domain and we were using the Laplace variable s. Okay, in order to study frequency response, we're going to go ahead and plot transfer functions over a frequency range, okay? So in order to do that, of course, we need to go away from the S domain and then go into the frequency domain. Now, if you studied Laplace transforms before, you'll know that usually you will let S equal some sigma plus J omega. Here, we are going to let the sigma equals zero for our purposes, our transform. And we're just going to study the frequency part, the frequency domain, okay? So in making this substitution, we're going to come out with a real part and an imaginary part, okay? So you make this transform, uh, or this uh, substitution. For every S, we plug in a J omega, okay? That gives us the function G of J omega. Okay. So then we have this function r of omega, which is completely real and doesn't contain a j. And then we have the x of omega, and I accidentally wrote a j right here, but uh, there is a j right here. So this is the imaginary part. Okay. So when you see a, a number like this, and you see uh, a complex, it's really a complex number, a plus jb, something like that, you can express this uh, not only as the complex number itself, but also in the polar kind of format with a magnitude and a phase angle, okay? And we recognize that just from complex numbers in general. So if we were to find the magnitude, we could express that through here, uh, just squaring both sides and taking the square root. So this is our formula for magnitude. If we just have a function, a transfer function, we can always find a specific magnitude or the general function of the magnitude with this, okay? And this is actually what MATLAB does uh, when you're plotting. Uh, you will go ahead and plug in a, you know, a transfer function and it will take the magnitude and be able to plot a function like that. And for the Bode plot that is over phase angle, we have another formula right here. Phase angle is the inverse tangent of that x magnitude, the, the imaginary magnitude, over the uh, real magnitude, the r of omega. Okay, and so that is our phase angle. All right, so you can also use these two functions to construct a polar plot, like I said, you know, you can plot this uh, in a polar format. And that's really what we're doing with Nyquist. Nyquist plot is going to be a polar plot, okay? All right, so in order to plot that, we need to move into a standard form, okay? So we've given these, these two formulas, we know what these are and where we're headed, okay? There is a standard form kind of format for constructing your Bode plot. So you're handed a transfer function. You first want to make sure that you are in the J omega domain, the frequency domain, and then you want to get that in a standard form. So you can easily pick out 
the different features of that transfer function with respect to your frequency analysis. Okay, so if we were to write this in a standard form, so I have an example right here. The main goal of that is to get the lowest order term in either the numerator or the denominator to be 1. Okay, so let me show you. First, we have a transfer function that we, we recognize is just in the s domain. So the first thing, of course, we're going to do is make our substitution from s to j omega. Okay, we move over to that domain and we're left with this expression right here. That's all we've done in this step. Okay, is we go ahead and try and move to a lowest order term being 1. What we're going to do is we're going to divide both terms in the denominator by 4. Okay, We do that and we have to multiply by a 4 so that we've really done nothing to change this expression. Okay, This, is the, this value is the ex exact same as this one right here. We have an equal sign right here to show that. And so if we were to multiply back out that 4, you see it's exactly the same, of course. Okay, So that's going to be our technique for getting the lowest order term to be a 1. Okay, All right, so there's really nothing we need to do up here for the uh, numerator in this case. What we can do in the last step is we've just divided the 5 by the 4. We've pulled the 4 out here. Okay, This is now in standard form. Okay. There is nothing else that we can do to this one. All right, so this helps us pick out the poles and zeros, where they are, and it also gives us the constant in a nice little package so that we can convert it to decibels, which we're going to do shortly. Okay, If we were to look at this, we can see that we will have a zero at the origin. What do I need to make, if we're just looking at the numerator, what do I need to make this zero? For omega. Okay, what can I plug in as omega to make the numerator zero? And that would be zero. Omega has to be zero for the numerator to be zero. Okay, so that is our single zero. That's all we got. For the denominator, if we're looking at this one, what can I plug in to omega to make this be equal to zero? Okay, so if I set the denominator equal to zero, I've got a j omega over four plus 1 equals 0, okay? So I would move then the, let's just write it out. Okay, so I've got this right here. Uh, J omega over 4 equals negative 1, and then I multiply by the 4 on both sides, I get J omega equals negative 4, okay? So the, J, the omega has to be negative 4 for this to be uh, equivalent, okay? And we're just uh, taking the absolute value of that, so the j won't matter here, okay? Uh, so the pole is actually at negative 4, okay? So that may not stand out to you because it's a positive 1, but just think you have to set this equal to 0, okay? All right, so a pole is at negative 4. That's frequency equal to negative 4. Omega is a frequency, so negative 4, okay? So recall earlier in the semester when we were talking about don't plot negative time, don't plot negative frequency. Well, actually, that applies here too, okay? Since omega equals negative 4, we can just go ahead and use the fact that the frequency in the negative range should behave the same as the frequency in the positive range. The only difference is going to be a phase shift. So yes, it is important that we found this, but uh, we can go ahead and just consider the positive range, okay? So our pole is actually going to be this equals, equals 4 right here. So let's do another example of moving into this standard form. So here I have this g of s, and we've got a 50 times an s plus 25, and then I've got an s minus 5 times an s plus 5. Okay, that's our transfer function. First thing we want to do is make that substitution of s equals j omega. So we do that, and we end up with a g of j omega. Okay, so all we've done here is made that substitution. That's what we end up with. Okay, all right, so now we want to start moving into that standard form. So I'm going to attack the numerator first. 
So you see we have a j omega plus 25 up here. I'm going to divide both of these terms by 25. In order to make sure I haven't done anything to change the equation, I have to multiply by 25 as well. So that's what we've done here. If we divide by 25 over here, we get a 1. If we divide by 25, we get a j omega over 25. And we have to multiply by 25 to make sure it's even. Nothing has changed. We're going to repeat that same thing down here on the denominator for each of these terms. So I'm dividing by a negative 5 over here, and I'm multiplying by that negative 5. And then this one, I am dividing through by a positive 5, and I'm multiplying by that. Okay, so if I were to combine all of these, you can see I've got 5 times 5, and I've got a 25. So the sign stays, so I move the sign up here, but these actually just cancel out. So we've got this expression right here once we do that simplification. And now using our frequency reflection, we did keep that negative sign. So we are noting the phase difference. That, that negative 5 still counts. It's still accounted for in our equation because we have that negative right here. Again, the negative came right here and moved up here. Okay, And then we have canceled the 5, the 5, and the 25. All right, so we're left with this right here, and we used our reflection to make this sign positive. Okay, so this is our final form. This is our standard form. Okay, we can pull out different aspects about this. We have a constant, negative 50. We have a 0 at 25, so omega has to be 25. And then we've got poles at 5 and 5. So we've got a double pole. Okay. All right. So getting into that standard form and being able to pull out these features is very important for the next part and actually doing the sketching. Okay. All right. So first we're going to talk about each of these individual features and what they do to each plot. Remember, we've got two plots, the magnitude plot and the phase angle plot. So this is actually really, really simple how to sketch these approximate plots. There are very few rules, but we just need to know how to apply them. Okay. All right, let's go into that. Uh, uh, one more thing before we do that, though, the range, we talked about this being a log range for the frequency. We use degrees, of course, for the, for the phase angle, and we use decibels for the magnitude. So decibels are really just ratio, and there are two different kinds if you're dealing with voltage or power. Here, we're, our formula is going to be 20 times log base 10 of whatever constant. If it's a negative value, ignore the negative for the magnitude for that conversion. Your negative value will be compensated in the phase plot. So we'll get into that, um, but I do want to point out you know, of course, we've talked about this before, zeros are on the numerator and the poles are on the denominator here. So here we would have a zero at z, at omega equals z. Here we would have a pole at omega equals p. And our constant in this is k, the symbolic constant right here. All right, so let's talk about what effect the constant has. On our plots. All right, so let's say we have a constant called k, just like we had in our transfer function right here, our symbolic one. All right, so if k is positive, the magnitude plot, so this is magnitude side and phase side, if k is positive, we calculate the dB value, and we just have our formula right here, the one I just mentioned, 20 log base 10 times k, whatever k is, as long as it's positive, okay? And that will give us the point where we start out on the plot. If nothing else happens, if this is all we have going on, we're just going to stay constant, okay? All right, so for the phase, if the, if the k is constant, if we have a constant that is positive, I'm sorry, the k is positive, yeah, uh, then nothing really happens. This doesn't affect us at all for phase. So we'll we just stay at zero degrees. If there's nothing else going on, nothing happens, okay? All right, so let's talk about when k is negative. So again, I don't want to take that negative sign into my log 
uh, base 10 kind of uh, formula right here. So I have my absolute value bars in that case. I just take whatever the magnitude is and I use that. And then that is, if k is negative, it's still k, that will actually affect our uh, magnitude plot in the exact same way it did if k was positive. So here we just have a flat line. If nothing else happens, we just keep that flat line, even if k is positive, okay? But if k is negative, you remember our negative sign is compensated for in our phase plot. So the phase plot takes an immediate negative 180 degree shift. So if nothing else happens, it just stays there at negative 180 degrees. So here's our zero, here's our negative 180 degrees. And we just stay there, nothing else happens, okay? So that's the effect that the constant could have, right? So at this point that we're discussing this, I'm assuming that we are already in the standard form and we're able to pick these things out. The constant doesn't need to be simplified any further. It's ready to plug in. So just like the form that we had here, okay? And of course, you could have multiple poles, you could have multiple zeros, and so forth. Okay, next feature, zeros. This is going to be a zero at the origin. We'll handle zeros at, that are not at the origin in a different way. Okay, magnitude side and phase side, again. Alright, so let's say we have this transfer function, g of j omega. Okay. We have a zero at the origin, and that's what we're going to be looking at. I might have something going on in the denominator. I might have poles, and I probably will. If I have a zero, I have a pole, <laughs> probably, at least one. But uh, this is what we're going to be concentrating on. So I'm not going to be showing any of the features of the pole in this, in this plot, okay? All right, so what is this going to do with our magnitude plot? We're going to have zero at omega equals one. Okay, first of all, we're going to hit that zero magnitude where omega equals one. So here I've marked the axis. We didn't really care about it in the constant plot because it was the same value all, all along. But you can see we have the marked decades here. The decades are now important for all of the other features. So we hit one at omega, at, at omega equals one, we hit zero magnitude, okay? Beyond that, we have, because it's a zero, a positive 20 dB per decade slope. That equates to, on a log scale, a positive one slope. So we go rise of one decade over run of one, one decade, I'm sorry, rise of one segment of dB, that's gonna be 20 dB, over run of one decade, okay? so. 1 over 1, slope positive 1 is going up, okay? So we can mark that. And I have a, I have a little band-aid right here. I hope this doesn't gross anyone out, but I did get a paper cut, so uh, I'm uh, shielding you all from that. <laughs> but anyway, um, so it's going to be positive because it's a zero, and we'll see the opposite. We'll see a negative slope for a pole, but we'll get into that shortly. Okay. As for the phase, how does a zero at the origin affect that? Well, we have an immediate, that is omega equals zero, immediate plus 90 degree shift. If nothing else happens, that's where we stay. Okay. So these are pieces, they're going to be added up uh, eventually. Uh, as we work, we'll work some examples at the end where we go through and add the different pieces and we have different features that we pick out but it's important right now, we're just going through what what goes where and what affects it. So hopefully this is this is clear. So two pieces, omega equals, at omega equals one, we hit zero magnitude, and then we rise by uh, plus one on the log scale plot, or a, you can think of it as plus 20 dB per decade, same thing. And for phase, immediate plus 90 degree shift, okay? And that's zero at origin. All right, for pole at origin, very similar and opposite, okay? Uh, we're gonna be talking about this segment of this transfer function. We're not gonna be discussing the numerator again. I'm not gonna show the features here, just the pole at the origin, okay? So 
we would hit zero magnitude at omega equals one, so we show that here for the magnitude plot, and then we would have a minus 20 dB per decade after that, okay? So that's minus one or a minus 20 dB per log scale decade, okay? For the phase, we'll have an immediate, that is at, starting at omega equals zero, 90 degree shift downward, so a negative 90 degree shift for a pole with origin, okay? So in general, you'll see this trend with Nyquist as well. Poles on the bottom, they affect things negatively. So you go down for uh, zeros there on the numerator, they affect things positively on your plots and things go up, okay? All right, so those are very similar. Those are pretty straightforward. Now let's talk about a zero that is not at the origin, so a zero elsewhere. Okay, so again, we're gonna look at this transfer function. We have a zero that is somewhere, I've called this alpha. So at omega equals alpha, that's our zero. We're not talking about what happens on the denominator with our pole, we're not showing that in our plots. We're just showing the segment. So the magnitude, we are zero until omega equals alpha. Okay, so it starts out at zero magnitude. That is, if nothing else is happening, we don't have a constant to consider nothing else like that. I'm just showing the, the zero. So it starts out at zero until omega equals alpha. That point is referred to as the break frequency. Okay, uh, at omega equals alpha, we then have a positive 20 dB per decade slope. So just like we had at the uh, zero at the origin at this point, at, at zero, we just have to wait until we have our omega equal alpha right here until that takes effect. Okay, so in other words, the, the magnitude plot is pretty straightforward for this. The phase plot, however, has a, a few other rules. So for the phase plot, what you're going to do is you're going to start out and find that your, that zero frequency, in this case it's alpha, and divide that by 10. You'll mark that point, okay? You'll then find alpha itself, you'll mark that point, and then you'll find 10 times alpha, and you'll mark that point, okay? At alpha, we want to hit plus 45 degrees, plus 45 because we're a zero, so we go up. And we start our climb at the alpha over 10. So at, that, at our zero frequency divided by 10, one tenth of that, we start our incline. Okay, we hit our halfway point, the 45, at that frequency, at our alpha frequency, at our actual zero frequency, and then we end the climb at 10 times that frequency. Okay, so all this together makes a special range that our zero takes effect over on our phase plot. Okay, if that makes sense. Okay, so there's three points that you need to be aware of and make sure you hit that plus 45 even. So if you're adding these plots and say you already have like a, a negative 180 degree shift and that's where you're starting out with, of course you won't be hitting 45, you'll be adding plus 45 to that frequency, okay? So in that case, if you start out 180, like negative 180 down here and you had a zero that, you, that was somewhere that you needed to account for in your phase plot, you would take negative 180 plus 45, so you'd have that uh, one, negative 135 now. That's what you would be hitting at your zero frequency, okay? And the overall shift is plus 90, so you would end up at a negative 90 here at your 10 times zero frequency, okay? And that's if something didn't happen in that range that you, you need to compensate for and also account for, okay? All right, so that's what's gonna happen here. Now we're gonna see a very similar thing again with the poles elsewhere. All right, so we have a pole. This is our transfer function. And so we're not gonna deal with anything in the numerator. Again, I say this every time we're going through these features, but I am only showing what's going on with the denominator and how that affects our plots, okay? So this is a pole at omega equals beta. So for the magnitude plot, and I show that over here, the zero, we're going to be at zero, again, 
nothing else is happening in our plot, we're just showing this one feature, zero until omega equals beta, okay? So at that specific frequency, that's when we're gonna start our negative 20 dB per decade slope downward, okay? Or a neg minus one on the log scale, okay? So that's what happens. So we don't do anything until we hit frequency beta. So until our pole frequency. All right, for the phase plot, it's gonna be very similar to the zero elsewhere plot that we just talked about, except we're going to be climbing downward, okay? So we have our negative 45 degree shift at our pole frequency here called beta. At 1 tenth of beta, that's when we start our decline. And at 10 times beta, that's when we end it. So we should have had the full effect of the pole by 10 times beta. And we should have our minus 90 degree shift by that time, okay? Again, if we were starting out at, say, plus 90 degrees, say we had something else going on in our transfer function and we needed to add this on top of it, these plots are additive. So you'll have a, a feature and then you'll account for everything else on top of that, if that makes sense. We'll, we'll show in the examples, but not necessarily going to have to go down to negative 90. This is minus 90 degree shift from wherever you were. That's what I mean to say. Okay, so overall shift is minus 90 degrees, but you uh, account for it within this range here. One tenth of the pole frequency up to 10 times it. Okay, hopefully this is clear. Now let's do some examples. All right, so I'm gonna go through this piece by piece. I'm showing everything happening at once on these plots, but we're gonna go through this piece by piece. Okay, so we have this transfer function right here. I've already moved it to the standard form. And what we've got is uh, a constant value of 33.3, so 33 and a third, okay? Uh, we also can see that we have a zero at omega equals 10. Okay, so if we were to solve that set equal to zero, uh, omega equals 10 using our frequency reflection, okay? Down here, we can see that we actually have two poles. We have a pole over here at the origin, and then we also have a pole at omega equals three, okay? So yeah, you can just look at with the omega in the numerator for all these fractional parts. And the way to quickly spot it is just whatever's on the denominator in this little part, that's your that's your frequency, your critical frequency. If it's a, a zero, it's a 10 here, or it's a pole, it's a three here, okay? All right, so we pick out each of these features. All right, so we have, let's say poles, it's plural, because there are two of them. The first thing we'll want to do is plug in this constant. It's positive, so I don't have to take the absolute value of it. And I plug it into my log scale decibel formula. Okay, let's label this decibel. Okay, so we plug in this right here. We get 30 dB out. So that'll be the point where we start our plot. Uh, so I've marked that here, 30 dB. All right, and we're going to start along the constant, what does the constant do for each of these plots, okay? And we can go ahead and we can highlight the constant in pink. We'll use pink for that. All right, so we start out at 30 dB. And if we're considering nothing else for that plot, that's all that would happen. Now for the phase plot, this is positive, so it doesn't affect us at all. The only way a constant would affect the phase plot is if it were negative and it would cause that negative 180 degree shift. But since this is positive, we don't have to worry about that. So we just have the effect of it being zero. Okay. All right, let's get another color marker. Hopefully we have one. <laughs> All right, good. I, I found one. All right, blue. Okay, so for the zero at omega equal 10 up here, we'll show that. Um, so a z what does a zero do? Uh, well, at omega equal 10, for the magnitude plot at least, 
we have to wait until a meg equals 10 or zero until that point. <clears throat> and then once a meg equals 10, that's where we increase. Oh, we have our slope. It's a zero, so we have a positive slope. So that's what we'll show here. Just like that. Okay. Now, uh, for the uh, phase plot, we're going to have uh, our one tenth and our ten times this frequency right here. And that's going to be the range where we apply that phase shift. It's going to be a plus 90 degree phase shift overall. So we have this right here, and then we increase. We want to hit plus 45 degrees at the omega equals 10 point. So we're doing that right there. And then we have our full effect, our plus 90 degrees here by the time we have 10 times the omega equals uh, omega 10. So that's 100. And then from then on, we're done. It just uh, stays at 90 degrees if nothing else happens. Okay, so now we have poles at the origin and uh, omega equal, let's see, omega equal zero and a pole at uh, omega equal three. So luckily, I have two other colors to use. Alright, so for the pole at the origin, we'll go ahead and use a couple notebooks in the stack right there. <laughs> uh, for the poles at the origin, we'll use green. Okay, so pole at the origin, what happens to our magnitude plot then? Okay, remember when we have anything happening at the origin, we want to hit the zero magnitude, and we should really label that, zero dB. Uh, effect again this is added on to the, what we already have but uh, in the dotted lines and the colored lines I'm just adding this effect isolated okay and we'll add them up to make a bold black line at the end so at the origin we have zero magnitude at omega equals one okay and then uh, we would have this is a pole so we have a downward slope overall so it's going to be minus 20 db per decade so we hit the zero magnitude right there and it keeps decreasing okay. as for the phase plot what happens with the pole at the origin well we should have a, a an immediate negative 90 degree shift and that's that's really all uh, it stays at, at negative 90 degrees if nothing else happens to affect it. Okay. All right. So a last uh, piece of our transfer function, pole at omega equals 3. So let's do that in orange. And for this, uh, how does a pole at omega equal 3, it's not at the origin, how does that affect our, our magnitude plot? Well, we're, we should be zero until omega equals three, and that's where we'd have our negative slope happen. So it's a pole, so it's a negative slope. Okay, so we're going to start here. We're going to say that omega equals three right around this section of the, the decade from one to ten right here. Just kind of an approximate point. And then we'll have our downward slope there. For our phase plot, we again have to have that one-tenth of our pole frequency and our 10 times our pole frequency and we apply our phase shift over that range. So here I have marked 0 0.3 so we're we have no effect until that point but then at that point over to the 10 times that's 30 we apply our negative 90 degree shift. We make sure at uh, at 3 at our actual pole frequency we hit that negative 45 so we're halfway there at our actual frequency. In the past, uh, I've tried to simplify this for students uh, quite a bit, but I find that if we go ahead and take these values as they are in, in this method, it's going to match the MATLAB plots a little better, so you can check your work a little easier. Again, it's not going to exactly match MATLAB because these are approximate plots, but you should be able to, to check your work and see, oh yeah, that, that makes sense, if you, if you like. Okay. 
All right, so now we go back and we add all of these together. Okay, so overall, if we were just to look at the magnitude plot, we would see that we have this constant, like baseline kind of value right here. We have a slope downward, a kind of a, a flat line right here, and then we have more downward, and then we have an upward. Okay, so we have a, a like a two, negative two slope here, and we have a plus one. So our slope past this point should be less negative less negative slope than before that point. So if we added it up, we should get a line that's sort of like this right here. So this slope is negative one, whereas this slope is negative two at this point. All right, for the phase plot, we'll have the at, at very beginning, we'll have the negative 90 degree uh, point right here. And then we have kind of a an increased slope and a decreased slope that happen very close together. And so we'll have a little bit of an effect as one happens before the other. And then we overall out here at very large omega, we should be back to negative 90 because these two would have eventually canceled each other out. So you have our positive effect and our negative phase shift effect. Okay, so we have this little dip and that's about it. All right, so let's do another example. Okay, so we have this example right here where we have a constant of 15. This is already in the standard form. We can see that we have a zero at the origin and we have a pole at omega equals 15. So again, we just look, look right here and match the denominator. And that's just a quick eyeball way to, to do it. Uh, the omega equals 15, that's our pole. Okay, those are the only three features that we have to plot. So immediately, we know that the constant is a positive number. So I can just take this as it is and plug it into my decibel formula. So again, let's label that as the decibel formula. Okay, 20 log base 10 of 15 is 23.5. So we've got that. Uh, and what we'll want to do is we'll, we'll go ahead and use colors again because that worked out pretty well. All right, so at the constant 15, we have a 23.5 dB value. Let's go ahead and mark that as dB. Okay, so really what we want to do is start out at 23.5. So we'll go ahead and mark that constant uh, effect will be in green. So here's our 23.5 dB. Now let's also write that value right here on the axis, 23.5 dB. All right, as for our phase plot, what would a positive constant value do for us? Well, really nothing. So we're gonna have a line of zero. Okay, next feature, let's do this one in blue. This is gonna be the zero at the origin. Okay, so for the zero at the origin with the magnitude plot, <clears throat> we know that we'll have to have at omega equals zero, uh, I'm sorry, at omega equals one, we'll have to have zero magnitude. That's the rule. So we know that right there. <clears throat> Because it is a zero, we're going to be in having an increase in slope after that. So it should be a positive one on log scale or plus 20 dB per decade. So we just sketch that out like so, okay, and just connect these. All right, for the phase shift, we should have, because it's a zero, an immediate plus 90 degree shift. Because this is the origin, we don't have to apply it over a decade, it's just across the board. Okay, and we'll make that sure that shows up. Okay, we'll do the last one in pink. All right, for the pole at omega equals 15. Now, for the magnitude plot at omega 15, we have to wait until that frequency before we can do anything. It's zero up until that point. And because it's a pole, 
at that point, that's when we start having the negative slope. So I'll shift down that way. So that's minus one slope in the log scale or minus 20 dB per decade. Okay, now for the phase shift, we will have uh, for the pole at omega equals 15, we have to apply that range again. So we take one tenth of that, that's omega equals 1.5, so that we've marked that right here. And then we take 10 times that, that's omega equals 150, so that's right here. And then we note our frequency as well, our, our actual pole frequency is 15. So we're going to have to have our negative 45, our halfway point of this overall phase shift of 90, neck 90, at that pole frequency. Okay, so then we just connect the dots. All right, and even in your homework problems, as you're working through this, and, and you will have a, a two problems where you have to plot the booty plot, it really does help to do this additively like this. And, and then you can really come, come at the end and uh, just kind of add it all together and see the effect of everything. Okay, so let's do that now. So we note that for the magnitude plot, we've got this upward slope we, and a, a zero comp, uh, contribution right here. And then we've got a positive right here, okay? so. We really don't have a lot of effect happening up to that uh, starting frequency up to omega equals one right there. So we may have a slight slope, but really from from zero to to omega equals one, uh, this is a very very small frequency range. <clears throat> some some plots will just start at omega equals one and and go from there. Uh, so. We have a kind of, I drew it kind of like a flat line, so something like that. Uh, past this point, you can see that we've got this bias right here, oh, just the green line contributing, and we've got an upward slope. So we're gonna see an upward slope right here. By the way, we started at 23.5 uh, dB uh, with, our, with our overall plot. Okay. Now, at omega equals 15, that's where things are going to change because we now have this negative one slope that is combating the positive one slope. So that should add up together and cancel each other out so that we get a zero slope. So it's just a flat line beyond then. Okay, so the uh, bold black line, that is going to be our overall. That's that's really our Bode plot for, for this uh, transfer function, okay? Uh, for the magnitude, that is. For the phase angle, let's add these up together. So we have zero up to this point, but we have the uh, plus 90 up here. So that's the only thing that's adding up. So we have this right here. So we stay at that neg that plus positive 90 up to this point. Now, at this point of 1.5, that's when we start to apply that pull at uh, omega equals 15, that, that downward slope. So that's when we go ahead and inherit that downward slope, okay? The overall effect of this pole is going to be a negative 90 degree shift, so that should end up canceling out the blue line, the zeroth origin. So we add these guys together, we should start at the 90, where the pink line is not contributing at zero, and then trend downward, and they cancel each other out by this point. We, add a, we have a plus 90, we have a negative 90, so we should end up back at zero, okay? So that's why it looks the way it does. All right, I think that's the last example I have written out for you. Um, but, uh, of course, as always, we can do more examples. If any of this is unclear, please let me know. Um, and actually, before we end this lecture, let's go ahead and uh, consider the case of having a double pole or a double zero somewhere. How will that affect things? Well, well for this class, and since we're doing approximate plots, what we're going to do is just double the effect. Okay. 
So for the magnitude plot, let's say that we have a, let's say we have a zero, actually. Let's do the zero first. Zero at omega equals, we'll say uh, 25. Okay. Let's say we have two zeros at omega equals 25. For our magnitude plot, as we draw this out, and again, we start our frequency plot at frequency zero. Uh, it, it's also acceptable to start at omega equals one. I prefer zero, but I think that's actually best. But uh, there we go. So we've labeled our log scale axis. We're just doing the magnitude plot, so we have our absolute value of g, our transfer function. And then we can also mark our 20 dB decades. Minus 20, and then the minus 40. Alright, so we have two zeros at omega equals 25. So omega equals 25 is going to happen right around here, let's say. This is all an estimation because I don't actually have log scale paper right here. Uh, but this is pretty close, I think. Okay, so remember our effect of zero elsewhere. It is zero magnitude until that frequency. And if it's a zero, we have our positive slope. If it's a pole, we have our negative slope. So here, we'd actually have a more rapid increase. We'd have double the slope. And it's that way from then on if nothing else happens. So this is gonna be a plus two in the log scale or a plus 40 dB per decade. 40 dB, okay. And so that's, that's what it would look like for the magnitude. Now let's look at the phase shift. This can be angle G. And then we have our omega right here. Now I'm going to draw this uh, axis since I didn't leave myself too much room a little bit shorter. So we'll have a 1, a 10, a 100, and the 1000. Okay. Omega equals 25 is going to be here. We also need to know the one-tenth value, which is 2.5, so we'll put that right here. And then we'll also need to know the 10 times value, which is here at 250. Okay, so the overall shift from one zero would have been a plus 90 degrees. So we apply that over the range. So what we're going to do is just kind of double that. So instead of just having the plus 45 degrees, we will have a 90 degrees. All of these add together, so if we were, if we were to think about it like I have a zero here, and then I have another zero layer on top of that, our cumulative plot that we get at the end, like the one that we draw in the uh, bold black line here, that adds all of the color plots together, that would come out to be this way. So. What we do is we have no effect until we have our one-tenth frequency. Now, instead of hitting the 45 point, since we have two zeros, we're going to hit the 90 degree point. So it's a little bit more severe of a slope. Okay. And now, instead of 135 up here, we'll go all the way to 180 degrees. And that's going to be what we'll hit at the one-tenth, I mean, the 10 times point all the way up here. And if nothing else happens, it just stays there. So it's a flat line beyond that point. Starts out, no contribution, just over that range. That's all we are interested in. Okay. We're going to have a very similar effect if we had two or even more poles uh, at a certain frequency. So uh, let's go ahead and look at what happens if we have multiple poles at the origin. So again, we would double the effect. Let's say we have two poles 
at omega equals zero. So we have a transfer function of some kind. We have equal to k, and say we have some zero. I'm not worried about the effect of k, and I'm not worried about the effect of the zero z here. I'm just going to show you what happens when we have, let's say, two poles at the origin. So let's put our dotted box around here just to say that's what we're concentrating on. No, the booty plot will look different because it does take the effects, obviously, of the other parts. Okay, so for our magnitude plot, let's get our decade out here, or our log scale, and the 1000 as well. Okay. All right, so we should have, uh, for, for all of this, uh, we, if we look back at the pole effect on the magnitude at the origin, say we have a pole at the origin, and you're probably thinking about this already, but say we had our pole at the origin, we would hit the omega equals one point, and we would expect to have a zero contribution, like a zero magnitude at that point. So that we want to make sure we cross the axis at that point. This is really not going to be any different, but instead of having this slope right here of negative one, we, can, we have two of them, we're going to have a negative two. So it's going to be a little more severe. And you'll see the more poles you have at the origin, the more it's going to kind of rotate like that. There's a really nice plot in your textbook that shows the effect of this. Okay. All right. So let's so here we have this effect right here, and let's actually go ahead and say 20 dB. It's just so I can provide some scaling for this as con in, in contrast to the one we were just looking at. And then we'll have a negative 20 dB and a negative 40 dB. Okay, so we're actually going to have a more severe slope. So this is going to be negative 2 or, and that's for log scale, or negative 40 dB per decade. Okay, and it's going to stay that way for the range of omega that we're plotting on. Okay, so again, this is still negative 2. We haven't changed our slope at all. Now, if we look at the phase plot, as you might expect. So if we looked back, our pole of the origin should have an immediate negative 90 degree shift. So just to point that out, here's our constant, the zero pole of the origin. So we have that immediate negative 90 degree shift. So you're probably thinking, well, we just double that and you're right. So let's write out our negative 45, negative 90, negative 135, and that's the halfway point to the next 90, so that's negative 180 degrees, okay? And so that happens immediately. I'm going to go ahead and put my log scale on here just so we can have our plot complete. But we stay at negative 180, and that is the effect of two poles at the origin. So I think we've kind of covered all the features and all the combinations that you might be able to uh, see in your homework and in different problems, uh, test problems, quiz problems, all of that stuff coming up. One thing I do want to uh, say uh, with regards to sim number three, so let's put a note down here, a note of uh, sim number three. Or if you decide to check your work with MATLAB, again, it's, it should look different. It's very easy to tell if, if you just, you know, spit out the, the MATLAB plot or not. But uh, 
for sum number three, one thing that may be confusing is if you have, if we flip back here, we have a transfer function with a, uh, a negative frequency in here, and really our second example had a good, a good uh, example of this. So this right here, okay? So the way you would plot a Bode plot in MATLAB is just to take, uh, you could use actually the S form of it, and it would be a little easier perhaps, uh, and you would take the coefficients of the expanded polynomial. So if we were to look at this guy right here, to expand this polynomial, it would be, and just the denominator is what we're talking about right now, s squared plus zero s minus 25. That would be the denominator, okay? What MATLAB is going to want is the coefficient. So it would be a one, a space, a zero, a space, and a negative 25, and that would be your denominator polynomial coefficients. You would also need to enter your numerator ones, which in this case would be the, the 50 and then 50 times 25, whatever that value is. Okay, and you would have two values as well, and they would do Bode of whatever variable you called that one, space, whatever variable you called this one, or, or comma. And that, that should generate your Bode plot, uh, just just so you know. Uh, I, I believe I have the instructions in there in sim number three anyway. But when you have something like this, if you were to take this form, which you can also do, and expand it out uh, and plug that in, so using this standard form right here, this also works, and it should, it should uh, give you the exact same plot. If you didn't reflect your frequency, that's gonna show up as something different in your plot, okay? So make sure you always have that step, okay? All right, so make sure you are either using the very beginning form where you haven't done anything to it in MATLAB or you are using your standard form, okay? One or the other, uh, no in-between steps <laughs> and, and make sure that you do the uh, frequency refle reflection right here. That should match your work exactly, or at least the behavior wise, okay? The values may be a little different, and also they will have a, a curvature in places that we won't, because we're, we're not, oh, we're just doing approximate plots. Okay, so I hope that this was helpful, and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, we're getting really close to the end. Uh, we'll talk about Nyquist in the next class lecture, and uh, we'll go from there with a review. And that will be it, and you'll be done with this semester. <laughs> All right, I'll see you next time. <laughs>